All right, here we're talking about the second group of applications of big data, uh, clouds or big data and science, where the uh, technology is called cyber infrastructure. Uh, compared to previous years, we've removed some discussion from uh, coming from uh, the usage patterns, which NIST developed in a project I was involved in. If you go to the 2018 lectures 2B, you will find that, ex that uh, removed data. But uh, I thought it um, a little, a little too, yes, this talk is already too big. I decided uh, it wasn't quite so important as some other things. So we go through several areas here, physics and thing, and astronomy and other areas, and describe the big data issues. Thank you. Well, s similar things. So cyber infrastructure is an old name from NSF. And it means distributed, it means the infrastructure that supports distributed research and learning, which is the same thing roughly as e-science, e-research or e-education. And the cyber infrastructure links data, people and computers. Remember in the 2015 uh, Gartner report, we were talking about in digital business linking uh, to things and people, you know, the business will link to the things and the people. And so this all proceed. This definition preceded things, and the computers of laptops and supercomputers and things. And it uses the standard technology, Web 2.0 and clouds, and it adds uh, possibly using the grid, although that's now a little old-fashioned, management, security, and supercomputers. Uh, it, it has actually all applications to in science. It supports parallel computing, which is for low latency uh, between nodes and distributed systems with high millisecond latency, where the low latency <coughs> is for tightly synchronized parallel simulations and the high latency is for distributed data and loosely coupled uh, processing. And uh, for parallelism, we need to do data decomposition. We gave some examples of that already. And um, the distributed is particularly relevant for things like biology with distributed gene sequencing or environmental science, even more dramatic distributed sensors. And uh, cyber infrastructure can be used for almost everything, from the video conferencing to the design of a new battery, uh, analyzing the world's telescope data, looking at personal genomes, looking at tweets, looking at the stock market, looking at the spread of disease, uh, looking at language, ranking institutions, and so on. Cyber infrastructure is just a general term which is just usually just infrastructure in the commercial world. All right, e-science which we can generalize to E more or less anything. I used to like E more or less anything. Now I find it, it's not so interesting because that's, that's gone. A few years ago, this was a really hot area, but it's now well understood and not so hot. And this uh, e-science came from John Taylor, I don't know, 20 years ago, 18 years ago, and it's all about Again, electronically enabled science, so using cyber infrastructure to support science. Um, and that's why these tools and technologies would be called cyber infrastructure in the US, and they need to do better, faster, different research. We will give some examples. And e business is, of course, what uh, got the called dig digital business, linking businesses, people. Uh, smartphones, uh, Alexas, and so on. And they say, we can think of more or less anything from digital libraries, fine arts, having fun, that's probably the most lucrative in education. And this all corresponds to a deluge of data, which you have to manage and understand, process. And uh, you need to link people, computers, data, and that data is sensors, instruments, like all the way from giant instruments like the CERN accelerated to smaller instruments like the environmental sensor on, an, on a bird or something. 
and we need to link them with hardware and software networks. Okay. So here is a rich slide describing the Large Hadron Collider, which is it's a whole bunch of magnets accelerating protons and antiprotons. And that tunnel is 27 kilometers in circumference. And they have experiments where the uh, particles in the, in the tunnel are allowed to collide. And then the fragments from the collision, which can be a thousand particles, are then analyzed in an apparatus. This apparatus is shown here for ATLAS, or CMS, and ALICE, and LCHB, or other experiments. Not, uh, CMS will be as big, the other one's not quite as big. And it's giant. Look, here's the people working on ATLAS. And there are actually 3,000 people on a single experiment. 175 institutions, 38 countries. So this is surely what people call big science. And then we need to take the raw data, which is actually um, triggered. If we don't take all the data, they need to do a strong selection for data of interest. We took the raw data, which is the measurements, like here, some raw data, which is actually a Higgs boson. And it's, kind of, it's measured in this giant apparatus with things that detect energy, things that detect photons, things that detect charged particles, and their not only their direction, but also how much they bend to be able to calculate the momentum. Um, every event is essentially independent. They're linked together when you do an analysis and see where unusually large number of events are and so on. And nowadays, LHC is 50 petabytes of data per year. It didn't used to be that size. And I, I say sometimes they just switch off the LHC. And years go by when they upgrade it. And the LAC computer grid does the initial analysis, which is the largest part of the process. And there are 200,000 cores, at least there were a couple of years ago, in, LH, uh, in the LAC computing grid. And they have tiers, uh, which are just ranked by where they are. Tier zero is CERN itself, where the data is taken. Tier one are facilities in Europe or England or, or um, US. And tier two are regional facilities. You can have any number of those. Um, so it, here's some numbers. CMS, a different experiment to access with similar. has seven tier one, 50 tier two, and it, man, it succeeds in getting all those people to work together. Here is the uh, first of a couple on astronomy. We have just here um, pictures. Here's the square kilometer array. And uh, these are all in different wavelengths. Here's the classic uh, large telescope, Mount Palomar. There's also the telescope in the sky, Hubble. And here's the Sloan telescope, which is aimed at producing more data very fast. And it's meant to cover a wide range of topics. All right, here's some multi-wavelength astronomy. And here you have the same region of the sky taken in different wavelengths. Actually, the prettiest is probably the visible, where you can see this beautiful galaxy. And if you look at it in different wavelengths, far infrared, radio, visible, x-ray, dust, dust map, galaxy, you get these dust maps and galaxy density maps. So this would require higher resolution data. Okay, here's the next one, Polar Grid. This is a collaboration, Indiana, Elizabeth City State, in Kansas. Uh, we have uh, data taken by aircraft by towing them, like we see here. And that data just looks down into the Earth and looks for snow layers. It looks for glacier beds. That has to go kilometers down. That data is then sent off to Polar Grid um, sites in uh, Indiana, Kansas, and Elizabeth City State. Here's the lab at Elizabeth City State. 
Here's a pretty frozen looking um, uh, wireless device, I think. And uh, they build those sleds in Kansas. Everything gets shipped by our favorite shipper, FedEx or UPS. And here it is being dragged along. So this is sort of contributing to climate change studies and by very directly finding out what mapping the glaciers. Here's another well-known example from uh, NIH, the gene sequencing cost. And here's the cost of sequencing gene. The first one cost 100 million, and now it's are thousand dollars. And <coughs> this plot shows a contrast with Moore's law. Moore's law hasn't had any revolutions, but around uh, 20, 2007, there was a revolution and the cost of the sequence of gene dramatically decreased. Now it's more or less leveled off at about $1,000. Here's an interesting um, curve highlighting an important issue which will come out at from several points of view. Here it's called the long tail of science. <coughs> And that says there are some fields like particle physics, that's the LHC, astronomy, the S square kilometer array, and LSST, and here's biology. And these are plotted about, um, these, are ha these have a few experiments, each of which is uh, very large, that's this up here. And, and then we have over here, we have the long tail, economics, social science, some biology, where you have individuals gather doing lo lots of experiments. But they've not got a lot of people involved and not a lot of data. So we have a few large data things, and here we have a lot of small data things. A lot of small data is the so called long tail. Long tail is very suitable to clouds because clouds are very effective at analyzing lots of things, each of which is not so big. They're not so effective at analyzing individually huge things because then you need to use parallel computing. And for some things like search and recommender engines, parallel, uh, clouds are very effective parallel computing engines. For other things like clustering, they're not so effective. Um, <coughs> so this is this type of graph is also seen when you look at books sold. There are a few books which sell an enormous amount, and lots of books which sell a small amount. And now if you run a physical bookstore, you sort of cut off here. Maybe you only have space to hold this. And the person going to the physical bookstore never sees this. This is why the internet allows, um, it's sort of more democratic, it allows the long tail to be accessed. And using recommender engines, you can actually suggest which part of the long tail people should look at. Pretty interesting. So here are some um, data intensive activities. Uh, from my point of view, I gave you the fellow, the, the Teradata, fellow Franks' view. Particle physics, which is a bag of events. Information retrieval is a bag of words. I'm trying to point out there's always a space attached to each of these activities. E-commerce, a bag of items to be sold or users trying to buy things. Social networking, a bag of people with links and properties. Health informatics, a bag of health records or a bag of gene sequences. Census. Lots of pixels, bag of pixels. And these applications here use statistics, deep learning, image analysis, recommender engines, or anomaly or outlier detection. And they do this on cloud. So this slide here really gives you a nice example of a rich set of fields in a different set of spaces with a range of tools all running on clouds, and they're using variants of MapReduce.